everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about this book right here. If you have not yet read Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, oh my gosh, you have to. You have to. And if you haven't read the Harry Potter series yet, you have to. I mean, if you're one of those people who says, oh, but it's too overrated because people talk about it too much, it's just getting started. So pick it up and then come back so that we can discuss. Intermissions are hard for most people. You know, you have to stop and then grow on a climax for 15 minutes until you finally get to figure out what happens after that. This is two separate plays. Right after we figure out that Voldemort Day is a thing, okay, go buy tickets for another show. Uh, that's all. That, that's the end of the show. That's, that's the end. If you're going to see the show, it's an all-day experience. It is a commitment for the entire day, or in some cases two days, or a couple days, or a couple weeks if you can't, if your schedule just doesn't line up that way, where you can't see part one and part two. Can you imagine the agony though? If I hadn't read this, and I was just an, an audience member going in blind, can you imagine the pain that would cause? It's like, at that point it's like, how in the world can you get out of this? You've gotten in so deep, how in the world are you going to get out of this? Moment of silence for those audience members who don't know what they're getting into. The show is over when you learn that Umbridge is running the school, and Muggleborns are being tortured in the dungeons, and Voldemort Day is being celebrated. Albus probably doesn't exist, and Scorpius is the only one left who can possibly do anything about it. End of show, go home. The, the absolute torture J.K. Rowling, how cruel can you be? I would want nothing more to be in a play like this. Of course everyone's saying that, because, you know, if you like theater and you like books, of course if you like books, you like Harry Potter, who wouldn't want to be in this play? But if audience reactions were half of the reader reactions, like, when I read a script, I don't react to it like I do a book, because it's a different way of writing, clearly. The formatting's different and everything like that. I was like actively reacting to this like it was any other book. A script looks, you're more aware of the fact that this is a piece of literature, it's harder to fall through the pages, but if audience reactions are half of the reader reactions, how much fun would this be to be in? I mean, obviously, this is the first canon Harry Potter production other than a Harry Potter musical. Something my sister pointed out to me is that um, at the very beginning, like the first stage direction in the whole thing, it doesn't specify Harry as their father. It just says, A busy and crowded station, full of people trying to go somewhere. Amongst the hustle and bustle, two large cages rattle on top of two laden trolleys. They're being pushed by two boys, James Potter and Albus Potter. Their mother, Ginny, follows after. A 37-year-old man, Harry, and his daughter, Lily, on his shoulders. Two boys, and a mother, and a man, a man and a daughter. And it... <laughs> we, we just thought that was funny. But let's talk about Ron and Hermione a little bit more, because the first time we go back in time and, like, Expelliarmus Centric while he's doing the first task, and we realize that the repercussions of that is that Ron and Hermione don't get together, and they're still flirting with each other. And part of that made me wonder, what if all of this is inevitable? Like, it doesn't matter what happens, eventually we'll get back to this point that we were at. Because, you know, Ron and Padma are together, and Hermione, I guess, it doesn't really say, but I think, I guess she's just kind of single her whole life. And in that, we'll get this little scene on the staircase where Ron and Hermione are talking, and Ron's like, yeah. so like, this kid told me that, uh, you know, he thought we were married. I think that's funny, but you're just my friend. You're my, it's funny, you're my, my funny friend. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> okay, well, uh, let's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go. And just, just having that scene there, because there was some romantic tension, absolutely, and Ron is making a fool of himself, and, and Hermione's just like, okay, like, is this not, th this, they're still flirting, and they're still, I can see if they hadn't gone back in time again trying to fix things and making things worse, as they do. There's enough flirting that I felt like if they hadn't gone back in time again and they just let things play out, I feel like Padma and Ron would have broken up and Hermione would have gotten back together and 
ended up having Hugo and Rose. Hugo didn't even make an appearance really in this, and I was kind of disappointed by that. I also found a severe lack of Luna Lovegood. All they had to do was go back in time and stop themselves from doing it. And I know that's a paradox, I watch enough Doctor Who to know what I'm talking about, but in the heat of the moment, of course, they don't see that option. They're like, we need to fix this, this isn't, this isn't how it went. Like, all this being in Gryffindor, excuse me, no, he's, he's a Slytherin. He's definitely- Do you see how much ambition is in these two? I, tell me they're not Slytherins. They are the epitome of Slytherin, and I love it. All of the father-son problems, all of the angst, so much angst in this book. Like, all this puts Book 5 Harry to shame. He's so dramatic, he's so angsty, he's so angry at the world. I guess he does have slightly more reason because Harry keeps insisting Hogwarts is the best place and he's like, I'm being bullied at Hogwarts. No, it's not. There's plenty of arguing and I can see both their sides. I don't have a side, but all parents and children argue. That's kind of half of the experience of having parents. Another Ron and Hermione thing is that when Albus and Scorpius go back, and Ludo Bagman's just rattling off his commentary, and he's like, and fireworks go off, and they say, Ron loves Hermione, and I just, I just, guys, mind your own business, and stop. Then another alternate universe time when they go back, they're being swarmed by Dementors, and Hermione's like, alright, uh, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, and Ron, I love you, and I always have, and... Uh, I'm gonna do this. All right, let's let's go. And Ron's just like, hold up, hold up. Can can we, can we talk about the love thing first? Can can we? Uh, I. And finally, they get together just in time to have their souls sucked out by the mentors. And that that is screw you, J.K. Rowling. Screw you. Uh. I said usually I'm not used to shipping canon things, and that held true when I shipped Albus and Scorpius by page 15. In fact, it was this specific line. Hi. I, my, my name is Albus. Hi, Scorpius. I mean, I'm Scorpius. You're Albus, I'm Scorpius, and you must be. The stuttering and the word tum- uh. And at first I was like, no, this is too big of a franchise for them to possibly be able to get away with you know, having their two main characters be gay for each other. Like, they're already facing minority groups with having their Hermione be a person of color in the play. Like, they, they guess they just can't risk trying to force the heteronormative culture away, even though Albus's namesake is confirmed to be gay. That's apparently not part of it. So, they, they've got their controversy out there. They, they, they won't, they won't. They probably won't get together, but I mean, so much suggested it. It was... It was there. In fact, the thing that made me realize this could this this could happen. This is a stage direction. Scorpius appears at the back of the stage. He looks at his friend talking to a girl, and part of him likes it and part of him doesn't. Yes, the girl was Delphi, so looking back on it it was because there was some dark in her and he probably sensed that, but is that not like the most part of him likes it and part of him doesn't. Just the wording of it is very romantic interesty. But then by page 300, all the romantic tension is gone and they're acting like friends. It was like a switch's turn, because they're talking about how Scorpius tried to ask out Rose. They're trying to... They're so... I'm gonna say it. They're so in love during the first three acts, but then by the end, it just switches off and I want to know what changed. They're acting differently around each other. Like I said, the romantic tension is gone. So it, you, it definitely, definitely used to be there. And then by the end, it's just, okay, we're done. So, friend, uh, something, something changed. Something definitely changed. And I I would have preferred if they got together or at least tried something or cleared it up or pointed out the elephant in the room at any given point, even if it wasn't canon. But like I said, I'm used to not shipping canon ships. Not a problem. <laughs> you know how the biggest thing in Harry Potter is always, in fact, <laughs> it's written all over the shirt I'm wearing right now. Always. That's that's the word that's like, I will always be in love with you kind of thing. And with that context, and knowing J.K. Rowling knows this, it, because there's a good chance she read a ton of fanfiction to write this book, 
Stage direction. Albus smiles and stretches out a hand. Albus. Friends? Scorpius. Always. Tell me she didn't do that on purpose. Literally, tell me she didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> They're so cute. So anyway, the first time they meet is on the train, which of course, it's how Albus's parents met, it's how Rose's parents met, and I don't know, maybe it's how Draco's parents met. I guess we don't really ever get that. Rose is like, I I don't know about this, uh, maybe we should go find another compartment. Albus is like, no, I want to stay here, and when Rose leaves, Scorpius is like, thank you. Like, that, that's... I, I'm not, I'm not staying for you, I'm, I'm staying for your food, I'm, I'm staying for the sweets. They just have so much fun together just on that first train ride, staying for the sweets and then get this fantastic friendship. I almost said, rela I literally almost said relationship. But tell me they're not adorable though. <laughs> That's the thing, isn't it? You don't know what he needs. You only know that he needs it. Find him, Scorpius. You two, you belong together. Only honest thing Delphi says in the whole script. And there's another time when they're in the wizarding hell with, you know, they're being surrounded by Dementors around the same time that the uh, Romani moment happens. And Scorpius is like, I need to create a Patronus right now, and I can't think of anything, I can't think of anything. And I was just like, if he thinks of Albus for a Patronus, for a second, <laughs> guess what he does? If he is the only thing that can make you happy, but you are surrounded by beings who suck all of the happiness out of you. <laughs> Their connection is just so... And then when Scorpius gets out of the wizarding hell and comes back and realizes that Albus is still in the lake for when they tried to corrupt the second task and came back, and he's just like, Albus, you're okay, oh my gosh, you're, I'm so glad you're alive, and he's, he's like, uh, <laughs> We were there two minutes ago. You, you're acting like we haven't seen each other forever. He's like, you don't understand. I was without you, and it was really hard. Yeah, I don't ship Dre, but I ship their kids. But do you see why I ship their kids? And at one point, Delphi destroys the Time Turner while they're back in time, so they can't go back. They're in 1981, and they just have to wait because they just don't know what to do. And just everything about this page, all this. As pleasurable as it will be to hide in a hole with you for the next 40 years, they'll find us. And we'll die, and time will be stuck in the wrong position. No, we need something we can control. Something we know he'll get at exactly the right time. We need a Scorpius. There's nothing. Still, if I had to choose a companion to be at the Return of Eternal Darkness with, I'd choose you. Albus. No offense, but I'd choose someone massive and really good at magic. Everything about that. But by the end, all, when all romantic tension is gone, it's funny because, you know, they were being happy, so naturally I'm just like, oh yeah, yeah, we asked our rose, and it's not gonna be canon. We have to talk about Delphi, because the thing is, she introduces herself as Amos Diggory's niece in front of Amos, so he presumably hears that, but doesn't do anything to correct it until the very end when we, re when we realize that she is the proof that Volitrix is canon. How did that not come up before, though? I, with the amount of time they spend with her and with Amos in different times, how does that never come up before it really, really matters? And because she introduced herself that way and she seemed so nice to them and she was so sweet and everything, we all, we all trusted her. So she is Voldemort's child. And I know we were supposed to think that it was Scorpius the whole time, and of course, we're not buying that because, like, he's our main character's best friend, and he kind of is our main character after a certain point when Albus doesn't even exist. Even after Delphi turned on us, I, I should have seen it coming from there. I should have known right away, like, wait, we know Voldemort has a child floating out there somewhere in the universe, and if she's suddenly uh, against our heroes who are for Harry, then maybe she's suspicious, but I didn't quite get there until they said deliberately. No matter what part two may say about her appearance, she has brown hair, okay? They can tell me after I've read the majority of the book that she has silver and blue hair. No. I imagined her with brown hair. You don't have the right to change that for me. So while I was reading this far late into the night slash into the early morning, you know, I was texting a friend at the same time and we came up with a few drinking games that would be interesting for this book. For example, every time Albus and Scorpius go missing, 
Every time we travel through time. Every time Delphi lies. Every time something happens that is so out there that you just wouldn't even be able to come up with it in a thousand years. Every time Delphi says father after page 287. Let's see, 287. Let's count. Three, four. Oh, there's two in one line and it's a two line line. That sentence just came out of my mouth. And the total comes to seven times in three pages. Consider this though, they saved Cedric, and even if he had been like alive and okay and not a Death Eater, who would have known the difference? It wouldn't be like a yay, you're alive, welcome home moment, it just would be daily life because they changed it in the past so that he continued living. They're not bringing him back from the dead in one moment. So Amos wouldn't care to thank them for saving his son's life because he wouldn't notice the difference. He wouldn't understand that they saved him. And it's almost like you only realize how much you love someone once they die, and you take them for granted when they're here all the time. You don't understand this person could have died. But because Cedric is a Death Eater, you're no doubt that Amos is out there asking around trying to get someone to save his son from the Dark Arts now, and not just from death. And he's just never going to be satisfied, he's never going to be happy with the son he has now. I found myself pondering the title throughout the book. Like, after I passed Act 1, I was like, so who's the cursed child? Is it Albus? Is it Scorpius? Is it everyone who reads this book because it causes so much pain that it's a curse? Who knows? And actually, I don't think we found out until the very end that I think it was supposed to be Scorpius because he wasn't supposed to be able to be born because there was a curse on his mother, and that kind of sparked its own little subplot in itself, so I think he was supposed to be the cursed child that's referenced. I think, personally for me, what made this so great, the fact that it was about time traveling, is that I was watching Doctor Who earlier in the day when, before I read this, and I already was like on top of all the paradoxes, and just I was in the mindset already, and this just made it like twice as good. You'll probably notice how often I reference Doctor Who because it, at the time, it, I was, it, I had it on mind. And I, I know that all this is just making it worse because you're just don't mess with time. Just don't do it. If you learn anything from book three or from Doctor Who or anything like that, you should know that uh, don't, don't, don't mess with time unless you're saving the world. But you mess with time so that you ended up having to mess with time to save the world. So, pause. So, you caused your own misery there. The impossible happened here, guys. Jilly shippers and snilly shippers found common ground. Crack ships became canon and canon ships broke apart in this book. Dolores Jane Umbridge and the headmaster or mistress of Hogwarts became the same person. Cedric Diggory became a Death Eater. Voldemort had a holiday once. What a book! I went into this book knowing very very little about it and by the end I am just absolutely blown away by the complexity and how involved I was with it. The fact that it was a script I expected to kind of be like pull out of it a little bit more just because when I read scripts it's usually how it goes. I'm just reading it for the lines and envisioning it on a stage. I was envisioning it on a stage actually with like lighting effects instead of actually being in where they are. And that's kind of what sparked the interest of, well, how in the world are they doing that? Because, you know, if someone shoots Expelliarmus on stage, you're not going to see the jet of light that you see in the movie. So that is kind of what made me wonder how in the world they make this a play. But I mean, with the amount of budget this thing probably has, maybe they do have the same effects as they did in the movies. Who knows? In my mind, I was sitting like in the front row of like a balcony, because like I was, I was definitely above it. I feel like I was almost like spotlight area, kind of, not like a catwalk, but yeah, I was seeing it from there, and I kept trying to move myself closer because I'm like, I want to see these actors better, but that's where my mind sat while watching this play, so maybe one day in the future, if I ever get to see this show, then I'll reimagine it that way, but now I have like this certain amount of blocking in my mind, like certain lines, I just imagine someone just skipping around the stage and just like exploding with lines, but in reality they're probably just like saying it in one place and going, hey, this and this and this and this, maybe with hand gestures, but I feel like 
don't know. I don't know. It, it would be so cool to see how it actually happens. But I just didn't expect to get so involved because I was imagining it on a stage, but I definitely did. Hours after my heart was still beating really fast, I'm like, that was... Wow, what an experience. If you saw my review on Goodreads, it's practically blank. It's like, I have no words. Amazing book. Harry Potter's always been my favorite series. It's kind of the automatic top spot, so when I'm ranking books, I say, that's my favorite, that's my second favorite. I don't even include Harry Potter because how can you? I have to include this one. It's, it's my number one favorite Harry Potter book. Maybe it is my favorite book ever. I don't know. It's up there. It's definitely, definitely up there, but hands down the best Harry Potter book in the series. When I say the most random things happen, like, not ran random isn't a good word, but it's just so out there. Like, the Wizarding Holocaust is happening while your OTP is separated and we're left rooting for Draco's kid. Did anyone in all seven books expect that to ever happen? No. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question I answered in anyway. It's like unpredictable thing after unpredictable thing after unpredictable thing made me try to sarcastically come up with like the most outrageous thing that could possibly be in this book and like betting that it would happen anyway. And the thing is, it got so random after a certain point that I couldn't come up with anything more random than it already was. I was trying, I was actively trying to say, all right, maybe he's not gonna polyjuice into Voldemort. Oh, no, he did that too. Uh, <laughs> like I ran out of things. I ran out of sarcastic things to say because it was all happening. All of it. Even the fact that it is so random though, it didn't pull away from how awesome it ended up being. It definitely takes a certain kind of talent to be able to write something as complex as this, but not only that, the ideas were just so out there and so outrageous that no one could possibly even begin to guess. And like, geez, J.K. Rowling, I knew that you were a Hufflepuff, but do you have to make the entire book uh, Hufflepuff colors when you take the jacket off? And maybe it's because I read it between 1 and 5 a.m., but wow, did this book make me cry. Let's just talk about... I don't know if I want to talk about this, but we're going to. We watch Jilly die again, and this time Harry's watching, and I talked about this already, but imagine seeing that on stage. Like, if I cried as much as I did during that, just by seeing a couple words on a page, imagine physically hearing it and physically seeing it and just being enveloped in complete darkness other than just what's happening in front of you. You can't put your attention anywhere else. It's just... Living in that would just be horrible. I cannot imagine. There's not a single person in that theater not crying. Like, I don't care if you're a Harry Potter fan. I don't care if you ship Jilly. I don't, and I still cried. But the thing is, when I was reading this, it, was, it wasn't, can you imagine seeing it? It's, can you imagine being Harry and seeing it? because he voluntarily didn't leave. Just so painful to read like all the stage directions where he's like flinching and like the light and just hearing it and not... Wow. I don't know if I talked about this yet, but um, Cedric kills Neville in another time stream. There is a dimension out there where Cedric Diggory kills Neville Longbottom. And it's canon. And the amount of times you split up Remini and and it, even it, even when you brought them back together a few of those times, it was just how and, and why and everything about Albius, naturally, I decided that's their ship name. I don't know if that's their like official ship name, but I think it sounds better than Alpius or Scor Scorbus, so I'm going with Albius. But everything about that ship is just the most beautiful thing, except the fact they never get together. Another thing, you didn't kill Snape, you gave him a Dementor's Kiss. How cool do you get? And you didn't kill Romini. you gave them Dementor's Kisses, a state worse than death. How about the fact that in one dimension, uh, Scorpius is left without Albus in a wizarding hell. That dimension was darker than any Harry Potter book, and the fact that it was aimed towards kids, like, it's the wizarding holocaust at that point. And because Bane just has to make some prophecy about uh, there's something wrong with Albus's life. Harry immediately goes, oh, it's Scorpius, it's Draco's kid, it's because he's Voldemort's kid, actually, so clearly, uh, they, they gotta separate them, but we know the best kind of love is forbidden love, so. I mean, um, 
that part made me cry because they're just really good friends. Just kidding, I know what I said. And Harry, of all people, is abusing the Marauder's Map because it was never supposed to be used to keep people apart. It was never supposed to be used to follow people and watch them, especially your own children. Uh, Harry, you of all people should know that. So why are you giving it to McGonagall and saying, if you see Scorpius and Albus together, I need you to go down there and break them apart. But McGonagall has very selective sight, and McGonagall's, McGonagall is just the best at this. Just the best. Looks directly at where she knows the invisibility cloak is and goes, well, I guess I didn't see him. So right when we see Jilly die, actually no, not right when, right after, we see when um, Hagrid goes to Godric's Hollow and finds James and Lily dead and takes Harry back to the Dursleys. That's something I never wanted to see. I never I never wanted to see that. That was the scene where I cried the most. Absolutely. I just broke down. Hagrid just saying, alright, well, um, it's okay, Harry, I'll keep you safe. Just like saying a few words over the bodies of his parents and like pulling out flowers from his pockets and going, okay, well, here we go. And just. It was the saddest, saddest scene. Imagine seeing that on stage, too. But it's emotions that make reading fun and that make theater fun and make reading slash theater worth it. Art, everyone. So finally when I finished the book, of course I didn't want to close it right away, so I always read the acknowledgements at the ends of books just because it's a little something I should have read and you know it's there for a reason. You're supposed to read the acknowledgements just to acknowledge the people who helped. And in the back of this one, you know, there's the original cast list. And a couple of things I just wanted to point out were that there's one person playing Harry Potter and there are six of them playing young Harry, meaning there are seven Potters. <laughs> and a shout out to Jordan Noble Davies for stage managing a show this complicated. I was a stage manager once for a spring musical and that was the most stressful thing I think I have ever gone through. Well, it's up there for sure. How can you possibly stage manage all of that? And it's two plays. Each one of those has two acts. The amount of work, I just... Another thing is that Dudley and Victor are played by the same actor, which body type wise, how does that work? The Trolley Witch and McGonagall are played by the same actress. What a range! What what a range! That's that's impressive. And finally, I also think it's funny that James Carter Sr. and Jr. are played by the same actor. I mean, I guess they would look alike in some respect or another, so it makes sense to me. And now, some of my favorite lines in the play. Stage direction. Snape indicates Ron with a flick of his head. Well, at least I'm not married to him. All this. Green is a soothing color, isn't it? I mean, Gryffindor rooms are all well and good, but the trouble with red is, it is said to set you a little mad. Not that I'm casting aspersions. I've never heard the term casting aspersions, but I'm using that now. Thanks, all this. Scorpius. Who? The Ministry kept it before. Do you really trust them not to keep it again? Only you and I have experienced how dangerous this is. That means you and I have to destroy it. No one can do what we did, all this. No one. No. It's time that time turning became a thing of the past. That's that nice, nice. Wait, there's more. Albus. You're quite proud of that phrase, aren't you? Scorpius. Been working on it all day. Got better. Albus. Does she know when he does turn up? Hasn't she come here twenty four hours early because she isn't sure when he'll arrive and in what direction? The history books correct me if I'm wrong, Scorpius, shows nothing about when and how he arrived in Godric's Hollow. Scorpius and Hermione. You're not wrong. Ron, blind me, there are two of them! That's not nearly all I have to say, but it's all I have to say for this video. So, leave a comment letting me know some of your favorite parts of the book, anything you like or dislike, agree or disagree with, let me know. You can subscribe if you so desire to see more things like this. Like if you liked. That's all I have to say. 
Salam.